Good morning, Will. What do you do with that rock? Morning, Preacher. I thought I saw someone following after me, maybe to do me some harm. Why would anyone want to harm you? I don't know why, but there's some crazy people out there. Well, I guess you're right, and it's the reason I'm on this road at all. The sheriff got word that a man from Spencer County may have come this way selling valuables to get medical attention for his young daughter. His wife has been trying to get word to him to come home directly. These peddlers always bring trouble with them. This man is no peddler. He's a farmer. You haven't come across anyone out this way, have you? I don't see many people out this way, preacher. Yes, I know, but I'm obliged to ask. Preacher, what kind of trouble would cause a wife to track him all the way over here? It must be 120 miles to Spencer County. Well, apparently, he was out trying to get money for some medicine that would save his little girl's life. But I'm afraid it's too late. She died a day or two ago, according to the telegraph the sheriff received. Dead? Oh, that's a real shame. Sure is. So if you happen to see a stranger, his name is Abel Johnson. Have him report to the sheriff and don't take it upon yourself to give him the news. You never know how folks are going to react. Well, I need to continue on and see if anyone else has seen the poor fellow. Have a good day and give my respects to Rachel. It's only six more months and you two will be married. Yeah, it's coming fast. I need a crop to harvest by then to give her the kind of life she's accustomed to. Well, Rachel loves you and a bumper crop or not. She'll be very happy to be your bride. All the same, will you put in a good word for me upstairs? I sure will, but you don't need me to ask God to help you. He wants to help us, unless, unless what? Well, in Isaiah 59.1, it says sin can cause God to not hear our prayers. What does that mean? We sin all the time. I mean, I'm not going around hurting people or cheating them. I mean, Rachel's had a good influence on me. It means unrepented sin. Things that you haven't taken to God and asked for forgiveness for. Is there anything you need to bring to the Lord? Because if there is, we can pray right now. There isn't anything, preacher. A few small crows rustle in the trees, probably impatient to eat the rotted deer meat in the ditch. Looking up at them, he curses them in his mind. Well, Will, I need to be on my way. I'll see you in church on Sunday. Yeah, I'll see you, preacher. The preacher continues on down the lane. After he is out of sight, the farmer picks up a rock and hurls it at the crows. They fly down to the ditch and stare at him. He backs away slowly and into the woods so they can't see his path toward home. Making his way through the brush, he stops to listen for any sound of someone following him but nothing. Through the clearing he can see his house and a bicycle leaning against the post. Sitting on the porch and waiting is his bride-to-be, Rachel. He runs to greet his fiancée and scoops her up in his arms, planting multiple kisses on her cheeks as she laughs and tries to wriggle free. We'll stop. You're the limit. Six months can't be fast enough for me. It's only been two days since Wednesday meeting. I thought you would have had your fill with all that sparkin' behind the building. I can't get enough of your kisses and your sweet-smelling hair. Well, I just stopped by to see if you want to have lunch at Mom and Dad's on Saturday. He's making catfish and Mama's making her hush puppies. I was wondering if you could bring some of your sweet cider to bear. For them to sample and, well, who knows? I know they would love it. It's amazing how blending these different apples sets it apart be an honor to have lunch with your mom and dad. How's the dress, casual or otherwise? You know my parents don't put on airs. They're just down-home folk like me. You say that and wear a different dress nearly every Sunday. 
That's only because Daddy owns a store and uses me as advertising. Well, does bespeak of money. Oh, nonsense. Is that why you want to marry me for my inheritance? Don't be childish. I would never marry you for money. Only love. They both start laughing and melt into another kissing spree. I really should be going. Rachel? Yes? Do you think God can forgive all sins, no, no matter the circumstance? Of course. Of course, silly. Why, what have you done? Oh, nothing. I saw the preacher on my way home. He told me God won't hear my prayers. If I have unconfessed sins, something about Isaiah. Well, do you? Do I what? Have unconfessed sin. Not really. I try to make things right as I go along. Well, don't worry about it. The fact that you have concern tells me he's reminding you, you know, just in case. I just don't want anything between us. I want my conscience clear. Of course it is, my sweet, sweet man. Okay, one for the road and then I'm off. As they break from the kiss, Rachel notices a horned owl preached in a nearby apple tree. That's odd. You hardly ever see owls during the day. My daddy tells me the story of an Indian curse. Seeing an old owl during the day means death and bad luck is coming your way. You don't believe that horse crap, do you? Language? No, I don't, because I'm a Christian. But the Indians believe it. Just as an owl at night means good luck. Well, it's just superstition. Well, I'm going to take a shotgun to him. No, he's not hurting anyone. You don't kill a beautiful creature like that just for sport, anyway. It'll be night soon. Maybe he's early on bringing you some good luck. Well, I've got to go. I love you, dear. I'll see you on Saturday. They walk to the bike, and he kisses her good night and waves her out of sight. But upon returning, the owl is nowhere to be seen. He spends what little daylight is left feeding the stock and hoeing weeds from the garden. He returns to the apple tree where the owl was perched and notices a large feather beneath the tree. Retrieving it, he heads straight for the fireplace and burns the superstition. Try to bring me bad luck. I make my own luck. He takes a gouge from his favorite bottle, making his head become floaty. The feather has trouble burning, so he pours a little alcohol on it, which flames up and almost catches his shirt. He backs away into a chair and watches it burn, yelling in the air, You can't fight fire! Yes, later, when those black crows take their rest, I'll return with a little misery of my own. When they wake, the little beggar will be gone with the night. He sits back in his chair and takes another gouge. He puts coffee on and waits for it to boil. He thinks how Rachel can never know of his drinking and about the peddler. She wouldn't understand. Neither would her uppity parents. Just one crop to gain their respect. Upon waking, the air is filled with the smell of burnt seeds and a gentle smoke clings to the ceiling beams like winter fog. The coffee had boiled dry, and the little room is filled with half-light of a three-quarter moon. The stars are bright, and there will be plenty of light to deal with the little mess on the lower five acres. With a little ham from the icebox, he cobbles together a sandwich, he cuffs his night friend, and swills down another couple hard swallows. Then... A tapping at the door sends him into a panic, thinking Rachel or the preacher had come up to hassle him about something. Peeking at his watch, it reads 1213. 
That's way too late for callers, he thinks. He approaches the door with slight caution. Turning the knob, he gently allows the door to open on its own. He quietly picks up his shotgun and readies it for action. After waiting for several moments, he edges out onto the porch. Through the silhouettes of trees and outbuildings, nothing stands out as peculiar. Only silence, crickets, and the occasional tree frog. Backing slowly into the doorway, looking down, he sees a large feather resting under his boot. Slightly confused, he remembers burning a feather in the fireplace, and perhaps another had blown up onto the porch during his nap. With little regard, he snaps the feather in half and shoves it into a flower pot resting on the porch. Closing the door, he makes ready a second pot of coffee to get him stirring before he heads to the lower five. Standing at the sink, a sudden and unwelcome smell enters through the kitchen window. Looking up, a figure coming from the porch casts a shadow upon him. Something warm runs down his leg as a head fills the window. Falling to the floor, he looks up through the moonlight that surrounds his horrid face. It's the Scarecrow, come to visit. The only thing he can think is run. So he bolts out the door down the path to the feed barn where he grabs a pitchfork and waits to impale the bag of pus. As he waits in the semi-darkness, he contemplates the behavior of the crows and how they fed the lifeless stranger and began to consider. Maybe through some miracle he's still alive. Maybe I should tell him his daughter is gone and that vengeance is not worthy of exacting. His dear wife needs him now. He should hurry home to be with her by her side. He gently speaks to the air. Mister? Mister? Your daughter's gone. Your wife's calling for you. She needs you. I'll help to pay for your transportation. And when the crop comes in, I'll send you half. And you and your missus, you can have another young'un. Are you hearing me, mister? With boldness, he inches forward until he can see the porch and the front door. Nothing. There's nothing. Dream of all dreams, and I've had some whoppers, but this one takes the prize. With pitchfork in hand, he races up to the door, only to find his coffee had boiled dry again. He picks up the shotgun and grabs the bottle and downs five or six big gulps. He fashions a torch from a stick of wood and some cotton binding and drenches it in coal oil. With his gun, bottle, and torch, he heads for the field to finish the scarecrow once and for all. Walking quietly along in the half-light, he begins to ponder.